We will be reading from Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18. It's found on page 67 in the Bibles in the seats. And if you do not have a Bible, you're welcome to take the one that's near you. And we also have other Bibles available that over there at the Visitor's Center that you can have. Exodus 31, 12 to 18. Hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave to Moses, when he was finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Hey, if you still have your Bible, uh, please uh, turn it back to Exodus chapter 31. Um, if you're, again, if you're using one of those hardback Bibles in the seats, it's on page 67. Um, so uh, please, uh, yeah, get back there. And as you do, like Ted said, if you don't have a Bible of your own, you're welcome to take that one that you're holding. Or um, we have actually some nicer Bibles out by the welcome, the welcome desk. So if you don't have a Bible of your own, we, wanna, we want you to leave here with one today. Um, so please take us up on that. Um, we are jumping back into the book of Exodus today. Um, we've been uh, off and on working, working through this book for a while. Um, yeah, like everybody who's been here is like, yeah, yeah, oh, it's been a while. It's a long book. It's all right. And every word is important. So we've, um, we've been going through it, and, and we are in kind of this, this final leg. We are going to, we're going to work through the rest of, in the coming weeks, uh, the rest of the book of Exodus. And we are coming to the point in the story where everything comes to a head. You'd think, that, you'd think that after God had rescued his people from, from Egypt, that that would have been the thing. That that would have been like, like the, the pinnacle of it. But the, the fact is, is that the book of Exodus still goes on for another 25 chapters after that. See, the book of Exodus, just let me remind you, is about something that we don't often think about. It's not... It's not just that God rescued his people from Israel, from, or from Egypt. It's not that just that God brought them out and gave them the law. The whole time that God was doing this, he was doing this to make himself known. All through the story, almost the entire way through, God kept saying, I am doing this so that you will know that I am the Lord. So that, hey, Pharaoh, you, the, the one who said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Hey, Pharaoh, you're going to know that I am the Lord. Hey, Egypt, you're going to know that I am the Lord. Israel, Moses, know that I am the Lord. Know me. Know me. You see, that is because of sin, because of um, the sin that we all, that, 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 corrupts all of our lives right down to the very core because of that that God's the knowledge of God is is a lot of times the last thing on our minds God's great rescue of his people is the starting point for his great rescue of the world 
That's what the book of Exodus is about. Know that I am the Lord. And here, as we get into these next few chapters, we're going to start, we're going to start here talking about Sabbath, and, and this is kind of the end point of God giving all his law and giving, and giving this description of, of, what the, of the tabernacle, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then, but then in the coming chapters, we, we run smack into the biggest failure of God's people. And in the face of horrific sin, not just, not just little things, but in the face of the most horrific sin, we find out who God really is. That's what these next few chapters are about. So let's pray. God, we, some of us have been in church all our lives. Some of, some of us have been just kind of spotty here and there. Some of us have, have just don't know, don't have a lot of background here and don't know what, what we're talking about yet. For all of us, though, we need you to reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes, open our ears. We want to know you, Lord God. And, and honestly, Jesus, the, the, the simple fact is, the simple, the, the, the simple fact that we have sin in our lives and we, and we do things to hurt ourselves and others and we, like all these things are present because we don't know you the way we think we do. Most of it, most of it a lot of times is, is, uh, it, it, it's just fantasy. It's not according to your word. It's not according to what you reveal. So Lord, I ask that you would give us the faith to hear and to see and believe what you, what you say about yourself. And Lord, I ask that you would give us a desperate, powerful hunger for your word and a longing for your presence, a heartache, a love sickness for your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. I think, I think at this point, I've, I've been here for your pastor for six years. Some of you, I haven't been your pastor for six minutes, but um, for, for six years now. And I think that I have probably preached on the topic of Sabbath more often than I've preached on any other topic. Um, why is that? Because it comes up a lot in the scriptures. We, what we tend to do is we tend to just... Uh, we just move our way through a, a book of the Bible, and it just, Sabbath just comes up a lot, okay? <laughs> um, so we talk, we've talked about it a lot, but I'm really glad that we have. And, and in the process of doing that, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm always, there's, there's so much more uh, around this topic. There's so much more about who God is that, that I'm learning. First of all, Sabbath, rest, is not primarily about self-care. It's not that self-care is not involved, okay? I know I got some therapists in the room. Um, it's not that self-care isn't involved. But the fact is, is that self-care is too reductive. It's, it's too small a thing to grasp at what, what Sabbath is all about. Sabbath is all about being with God. It's meant to drive you to, to say things like um, the, the wife's voice in the Song of Songs when, when she says, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him, I am sick with love. Sabbath is meant to drive you to that. Love sick. Desperate for his presence. Look, we've as we've moved, as we the last maybe six chapters of Exodus have been all about how the tabernacle was supposed to be built. Right? And all along we've talked about what God's purpose was in giving the tabernacle. God, God's purpose was that he would dwell with his people 
and meet with his people. The tabernacle actually is just the English word that we use for the Hebrew word that means dwelling. In, it literally means dwelling. Okay, And for about half of that, that description of what the tabernacle was supposed to be, um, God, and it just used that term, dwelling. This is my dwelling. You're going to build my dwelling. But then about halfway through, it doesn't mention dwelling anymore. It starts to call the tabernacle the tent of meeting. God's purpose was to dwell with and meet with his people, not just be around, but also come face to face with and meet with his people. So that's his purpose. But there's a difference between purpose and goal. And not all the time, but, but a lot of times. There's a differentiation I want to make here. Like I have, um, I have a purpose in in. My, my purpose in, in preaching this morning is that you would know, know the Bible and know God. My goal is that you would hear his word and you would be desperate for him. The, the goal refers to the end point. So if God's purpose is to dwell with and meet with his people, his goal is something a little bit different. The goal of dwelling and meeting with Israel is Sabbath. It's rest. All of this, everything that God has been commanding His people to do, every, all the detail around the tabernacle and all these other things that if you, if you read the book of Exodus, uh, like all these things that God tells His people to do is toward this goal where we would lay down all of our works we would lay down our labors and our sinful works and we would cast our whole selves into the arms of the living God. That is God's goal. After all said and done, God gave Israel a constant reminder every seventh day. My purpose is to dwell and meet with you. My goal is to give you rest. But in order to, to rest, you need to have this Sabbath. You need to do this as a constant reminder so that you don't see all these commands that I've, I've, I've commanded you, all these, do all these works, and think to yourself, oh, I've got to make myself holy enough for God. No, 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 no. What, is, what does God say? This is a sign to you so that you would know that I, the Lord, in verse 13, sanctify you. Sanctify just means make holy. I, the Lord, make you holy, is what he's saying. All, the Sabbath is a sign to Israel that, that God is the Lord and he makes them holy. I want to Stop right there before we really dig in, okay? What does that tell you about God? What kind of God is he really if his whole goal is to, is to give you the rest that you so desperately need, give you relationship with him for which you were created. If his, if his purpose is to be with you and to meet with you, what does that tell you about God? Because I, I'm asking you that because most of us, if not all of us in some way, are running around thinking that God, God has us doing all these things so that we would, so that we would be good enough. And, and when we think that about God, we come in, we think, okay, well, I got to go, I got to go and do my thing to be at church and, and, uh, and, and check that box, right? God has put this burden on us. 
when, when we think of him that way. It's just we're thinking of him as like another pharaoh, adding burden to burden. God says, I'm actually not that at all. Are we going to believe that today? Are we going to believe that? Okay. I want to talk about, as we, as we dig into this, let's talk about the, the very thing in this text that probably will lead you to think, oh, Mike, you're wrong about all that. Let's talk about death. Let's talk about death as a consequence for, for not doing the Sabbath. Why is that the consequence? Last time we were in Exodus, a few months ago, um, our friend Max preached on this, and he asked this very question because it, it came up, and it, it has come up a few times already. Why is death the consequence for failing to obey God? It's because being in God's presence is not a trifling matter. God is absolutely holy. To enter into his presence is to enter into the presence of the one that the Bible describes as a consuming fire. In fact, for a sinner, all of us, the most dangerous place you could be in all creation is in the presence of the living God. That's reality. So, God is not tame. And his presence is nothing to be trifled with. But the truth is, why is God warning him, warning them? He's not laying a consequence on them that like, hey, if you trip up a little bit, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, here, to, I'm here to smite you. I'm here to throw a bolt of lightning down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to waste you. That isn't what, that's not what God's saying. He's saying if you, if you act this way in my presence, you're not going to survive. He's warning them. Because he wants them not to die. That's why he's warning them. Max put, the, put it this way a couple, a couple months ago. He did a great job with that, by the way. Um, he, he put it this way. He said, God wants to dwell and meet with Israel, not cut off and cast out. He wants to dwell and meet with Israel, not cut off and cast out. He, does, he desires not to condemn. He, he desires that Israel would come into his presence and live, find real life. But how can that happen in the presence of a God who is a consuming fire and is absolutely holy? Maybe our question shouldn't be, why is death a consequence? Maybe our question really should be, as we consider who this God is, is why is he so determined that we would be in his presence and live? Because he is. He is. He says, he says, you must, above all else, keep my Sabbaths. You must keep my Sabbaths. That's Weird, isn't it? He, is, he has, for, for now over 10 chapters of the book of Exodus, we have heard law after law, command after command, build this, do this, all these other things. And he says, above all else, stop. Stop. Lay it all down every seventh day. This the Sabbath is a sign that was, that was built right into creation. Is he, he says that in, in, verse, in verse, 17, so it's verse 17. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. God, and when, as he created and he finished his work, he didn't immediately step into the next day and do and. and Keep going. He, he filled it up with meaning that it, that it 
it doesn't, we're not just on a hamster wheel here. We're not just go, meant to go and go and go and go. This is a sign that reminds us that uh, in every, everything else in creation as well, that you don't exist for yourself. You have limitations, and those limitations are really good for you. Your life has meaning. Your work has an end. God is not interested. This tells us Sabbath is built into creation, and, and it tells us that God does not give a rip about how much you can produce for him. He's interested in you. That's there. That's right there in Genesis 2, the second chapter of the Bible. That is what God was doing when he rested. Sabbath is the goal of creation itself, but now in Exodus 31, it's transformed into something even more specific. God says, this is a sign between me and you. Now it's a sign that is specific to the covenant relationship between God and Israel, between Yahweh and Israel. What is a covenant? Covenant is a fun word, but we don't usually, we don't usually define it enough. It's, it's an agreement, right? But, but a covenant in the Bible is this. It's, it's, that it's where God speaks a relationship into existence that did not exist before. By his very word, he speaks into existence what did not exist before. And by making this covenant with Israel, by giving him the Ten Commandments, the laws, the tabernacle, God has spoken a relationship into existence that did not exist before. I am your God who desires, whose purpose is to dwell and meet with you. You are my people. Your, my goal for you is that you would find rest. It's a sign of the covenant. Let's talk about what a sign is. A sign is something that points to something else. Yeah, I mean, very simply. When God made, God has, has made covenants uh, with, with in, in other places in Scripture, there's one, there's a big one before this, this covenant he's made with Israel. It's with their ancestor, Abraham. And whether you, if you don't know the story, whether you know the story or not, back in Genesis chapter 17, God, God actually in, in Genesis 12, in Genesis 15, and 17, and 22, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And, and, and in, se, in chapter 17, what he does is he gives Abraham a sign for that covenant. Just like he's giving Israel a sign of the covenant here. He gave them circumcision. It was, circumcision was ultimately a sign to Abraham about God's sovereign choice to pour out his grace on Abraham's family, that he would bless him and bless the world through him and his family, that he would give him an inheritance, and that ultimately they would be a people that didn't just have, have circumcised flesh, but would have circumcised hearts. They would be transformed, they would be changed, they wouldn't be just sinners on the run, they would be his they wouldn't be orphans. They would be children in the household of the living God. And through this family of Abraham, God promised to bless and redeem and gather in a people from every tribe, people, and language in the world. A people redeemed and restored from the exile and the alienation that we all have from God because of sin. That's the human condition. That's not just a couple people. And that's that's not just because every once in a while you mess things up. That's not what, that's not what being a sinner means. Be, we're, we sin because we're sinners. What, like sins come out because there's corruption in our hearts. We, got it, we usually get it twisted around and act like, yeah, well, I messed up there, but that's not really me. But that's not the reality. And God has done all these things. He gave this promise to Abraham so that, it, so, so, so that the world would be restored to him. 
No longer alienated, no longer orphans. God gave, made that covenant with Abraham and he gave Abraham a sign of circumcision. And any, look, and even there, any of Abraham's household that would refuse that sign were to be cut off from his people. God wanted to gather in, not cut off. Circumcision tells that story. It's the story of being included in God's family. And to not take that sign means I don't want to be included. But now God's made a covenant with Israel through Moses. And the Sabbath, the, day, the seventh day, is the sign of that covenant. Do all these things. Do, do, do all these commands. Build this tabernacle. Here's a sign for you. Stop. Man, that's weird. I love that. God tells us, but God tells us more. It's a sign to Israel. Look at the end of verse 13. Look at the end of verse 13. It's a sign that you may know that I, the Lord, make you holy. Sanctify you. So, just like in the covenant of Abraham, all who, who, who profane this, this sign, this, this rest, will be cut off. So to profane something is to defile it in some way. It's the, it's the kind of, it's not just to become unclean. If you've read the Old Testament before, you know that there's these, these categories of clean and unclean, and maybe you have some idea about what that is. Most of us don't, but, and that's okay. We're not just talking about that, though. We're talking about defiling something that's holy. It's the term that, some, that the Bible uses when, when the marriage bed is defiled or, by, or when someone, someone makes their daughter into a prostitute. Like something like, or, or child sacrifices. What's, or, or, or what's being done in the Lord's name when, so, when one of his people bears false witness? It's, it's to take something holy and to throw it into the garbage. <laughs> there's, there's something a bit unique here in, the, in this text. It only happens twice in the whole Bible. I mean, the Sabbath comes up all the time. But look at, look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. It says, Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Now, keep and observe, those are pretty, that's pretty common language. The, th- the thing that that kind of covers over is that the, the word there behind keep is do. Do the Sabbath. That only, happens, that only happens one other time in the whole Bible. In Deuteronomy 5, when Moses is repeating the Sabbath command. And he says, he says this. He says uh, in Deuteronomy 5, he says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, having burden upon burden placed upon you. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep, do, the Sabbath. How do you do Rest. How do you do stopping? <laughs> that's maybe why, why, that's, that's why it makes really good sense to, to not translate it that way, to say keep the Sabbath, because that's really what, that's what it's getting at. But, but it, it points to the simple fact that rest, that Sabbath rest is not passive. It doesn't just happen. Has anybody ever tried to like, say, I'm going to get really serious about this in my life, and I'm going to set aside a day? Has anybody ever tried to do that? How'd that go? It's really hard, isn't it? Because it doesn't just happen. It doesn't, it's not about just sleeping in. Rest, in, in, in Sabbath rest, the way that God is talking about it, is, is purposeful. Israel must do the Sabbath so that they will know that I am the Lord and I make you holy. Refusing to enter that rest is to deny God's good desire for his people. To deny God's goal is to play out your life as though you were just that, that or as though God were just another Pharaoh. 
piling on burden after burden after burden. And I know there are some in here that feel that way about God, even if you don't want to admit it. But here's the simple truth. It is a violation of God's holiness not to enter his rest. It violates his holiness not to enter his rest. God says to Israel in the Sabbath, he says, I make you holy. I created you. I have saved you. I sustain you. I have made you beautiful and you are beautiful in my sight. But you will never have a clue about this. You will never know any of this. And you will, in fact, find yourself cut off until you stop and wait and know that I am he who loves you. I am the Lord who makes you holy. Lay down all of your works. You think you're doing all this for me? God says, the reality is I'm giving you all these commands for you. I make you holy. I make you holy. All the ways you're trying to find holiness and wholeness for yourself. And lay them down. I make you holy. I do it for you. And I'm going to make you sit still and do nothing until you admit it to yourself. Until you know it. And what is the, res- what, what is the intended response? And I'm, and I'm stepping way back to kind of view the, the Bible as a whole. What am I telling you is the, is the response to Sabbath. It's, I am God. I am desperately lovesick for you. Lord. That's what Sabbath is meant to do in you or in his God, in God's people. We uh, the Sabbath was the sign of God's covenant to in, in when God gave his his covenant through Moses. But what does that mean for us now? Because we're not under the covenant to Moses. See Jesus, the the Sabbath is the goal of God's covenant. Jesus is the goal of the Sabbath. Jesus is the goal of the Sabbath. You know, paraphrase a, a Old Testament theologian, Mike Morales, um, who who says, when when Jesus when Jesus went to the cross and between the cross and the resurrection, when Jesus' body rested in the grave. He completely fulfilled this sign of Sabbath. All was done. And his body was, in, was resting in the grave. He fulfilled the Sabbath and the law of Moses fully. And as he burst forth from the grave into new creation life, on the first day he brought in the promise of eternal rest and new covenant. This is why we set aside the first day of the week, Sunday. The the seventh day is Saturday. Sabbath is now transformed in Jesus into something that we experience always. It's not just a day of the week. For Christians, hear me. This is because we have to bridge this gap a little bit because there's not just a one-to-one between what God told the Israel to do and what he's telling us to do at being in Christ. For the Christian, the Sabbath has been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled in Christ. It's now transformed into a rest that we experience always and a rest that we especially enjoy when we gather to worship. And we do that on the Lord's Day, the, 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 the resurrection day. 
That's when we do, that's why we, we meet on Sunday mornings. That's why we do, it's, that's why we still devote a day to this. Not because God is holding this over our heads saying, this, these are the terms, like doing this every seven days is the terms of you being my people, but because he's saying, if you don't do this, you are going to forget like that, that you have everlasting rest in my son Jesus. Jesus is the goal of the Sabbath. He is the sign of the he himself is the sign of the new covenant. And Jesus can only be taken hold of by faith. Not by your works, by faith. Which faith all faith is is receiving and resting. It's accepting and receiving and resting. Those are, that's what faith does. Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath perfectly. We don't add anything to his work. So, so, so keeping Sabbath, keeping Sabbath is not an extra work that we're supposed to do. It's the goal of the law that was fulfilled in Jesus in having Jesus it is the reality that we all live in all the time. Jesus is our reality. Sabbath, so this, this Sabbath rest that we have entered into, it, it, it does something to us. It makes us ache for his greater presence. It makes us ache for the consummated kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. Something we can't get by working, but by waiting and believing. We get it by stopping and resting in Jesus. It ignites in us a fire of love for God and for his presence. Jesus, Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Lord of the Sabbath does not much, doesn't put a lot of stock in what you think about taking off a day of the week. He doesn't steer by your compass. He's not, he's not wrapped up in that. You must enter into his rest. You must enter into the rest that Jesus has offered you. You might, not, you might not think it is important. But you, until you do, you will not experience the, you will not experience the goal. A lot of times I, I ask you all when I'm talking to you one-on-one, -on -one, how can I pray for you? And sometimes you all have some that, something to say and some, a lot of times you say, oh, I'm good, as though that were true. Some, but I don't often tell you how you can pray for me. And honestly, how I, how, how I am praying for you these days. If you speak to my beloved the Lord of the Sabbath, tell him I'm, his Sabbaths have made me love sick for him. Tell him to come quickly to me. Beg him to do that. Pass that along to, uh, to him because I'm, I'm, I'm telling him that for you too. God delights that you would come near that you would dwell with him, that you would meet with him, that you would rest in him. What are you running from? What are you running from? And not just on the seventh day of the week, but <laughs> or the first day of the week. What are you running from every, every second of every day? Is it, is it this God that we've been describing? The one that, the one that is, is, is revealed here in his word? Or is it a God of your, of your own making that, 
that can be manipulated and, and, can, and is kind of like a fuzzy teddy bear, but ultimately can't help you and ultimately just wants you to do stuff for him. Which God are you following? Which God are you chasing down? My friends, I want you. Oh, I want you to be, I want your hearts drawn out. That is my goal. It is the Spirit of God who will do so. So ask His Spirit where you are running and where you won't rest. Find it. There's probably a bunch of different places in your life. Know that know that there's someone out here praying for you that you would fall desperately head over heels in love with him. Enter his rest. Jesus, we Hearing that, honestly, Lord, the mo- most of my, my mind is shouting, is screaming. I don't know how. I don't know how to lay all the stuff down. I don't know how to. I don't know how to enjoy your Sabbath. I don't know how to enjoy this eternal rest we have in Jesus. Lord, would you teach us? Lord, will you guide us? Lord, will, oh, Jesus, Jesus, would you come? Every moment of every day, you promise that you dwell with us. And you do. You make good on that promise. Lord, we, we ask that you would change us, though. That we would see you as you are, good, holy, yeah, a consuming fire, but now because of Jesus, because of all the work that you have done, Jesus, now now a, a God whom we can boldly approach in prayer. Fill us with your delight. In Jesus' name, amen.